we're good. Um, welcome. Again, welcome. Everybody that's in this room, I want to welcome the other women who are joining us via podcast, our um, Union Cross campus and our Clemens campus. And any woman under the sound of my voice who is just tuning in via podcast, we, we welcome you this morning. Paul wrote in Ephesians, he wrote the book of Ephesians from prison. He was awaiting trial. He was in Rome. And he wrote these words in Ephesians 3.20. To our God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. So God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine. And today, I want to talk about a promise that would definitely fall into that category. A promise, a mind-blowing promise, that's exceedingly abundantly beyond anything. I feel like I'm clicking. Is this an earring thing? Okay. Again, I'll just stand like this and talk. (laughs) Or I kind of look cool. You know, doesn't they have kind of a cool thing? I wish I had a tattoo. I could roll up my sleeves and you know, I got the one earring thing on and, you know, I'd really have it going on. Okay, we're moving on. So God is able to do exceedingly abundantly and the promise for today is the promise of heaven. You want to talk about mind-blowing stuff, exceedingly abundantly above anything that we could ask or imagine? We're going to talk about heaven. I found myself saying to Alan last night, do you ever find yourself before you preach just so excited you can hardly stand it? And he said, yeah, I do. I said, I feel that way. I couldn't wait to get over here today to talk about this promise. Because if you grab hold of this, it changes the way you live life today. This is a promise that's not yet. It hadn't been fully realized yet. And yet it should change everything about the way that we live today. We don't, we don't talk about heaven much, do we? I mean, we really don't talk about heaven much. It ought, to be, it, it ought to be something we talk about every day because it's an amazing promise to us. Even in the church, we just don't, we don't talk about heaven much. Um, several years ago, Alan did a sermon series on heaven because he realized that he'd never really talked much about heaven. I um, have never spoken on heaven. So this has been a, um, these weeks preparing for this, weeks of just diving deep into what the Word says. I want to give credit where credit is due because Alan had preached a sermon series. I went back and groveled through every note. <laughs> I mean, everything scribbled on a, the bottom of a coffee cup. I mean, I, everything that he'd written, I read. Um, so I want to give him credit. Some of this is just blatantly, blatantly. I asked him last night, I said, do I, do I need to give you credit? And he said, well, no, you really don't. You know, I am your husband. But <laughs> I am because he deserves it. So, so um, uh, I want to thank him. And I also borrowed some insights from Randy Alcorn's book entitled Heaven. And let me commend that book to you. We're coming into summer. I'm speaking blessing over all of you. You're going to find yourself with time to read Heaven by Randy Alcorn. It's an amazing, amazing book. So I've been thinking about that this week. Why don't we talk more about heaven? Why haven't we? Why don't I know more um, about heaven? I think there are different reasons. I think one is that they're just misconceptions. There's just misconceptions out there about heaven, and we don't really know about heaven. It's a little bit of that da-da-da-da-da-da. You're right, fear of the unknown. So we just don't even want to get a conversation with it because we don't even know how to engage somebody about heaven. Right? Okay, y'all, I know this is true. Right. How many of us are a little bit uncomfortable engaging somebody because we don't really know what the Bible teaches about heaven? Right? I went um, 
uh, some years ago, Alan was going to be involved in a funeral, uh, a memorial service in Greensboro. And so we traveled to Greensboro. And because I did not know the family well, I was with Alan. And I wanted to be there, but I didn't feel to go with him when we arrived. The, the service was at the funeral home. And I, I didn't go with him back to greet the family. I just went on into the chapel there at the funeral home where the service was going to be. There was nobody there yet. We were there very early. So I sat there by myself, which was really nice in the quiet. And I hadn't been there too long. And too, it, the, the gentleman that had passed away was an elderly man. He'd led a wonderful life. He loved the Lord. And uh, two elderly women walked in um, as I was sitting there alone. And they walked down the center aisle. And the casket was open um, for the service. And it, there it was. And they went up right up to the casket and they both leaned over and were looking at him. And uh, one of them, after they looked for a bit, said to the other, she said, you know, I believe Carl has lost a little weight since I saw him last. <laughs> now, I did have that thought. He, he's died since you saw him last. We, we just don't know much about the afterlife, much about death. Alan, we were chatting about this. He shared a funny, and I thought you guys would appreciate it. So a woman dies, and she goes to heaven, and she goes to the pearly gates, and there's St. Peter, and uh, she says, I'm here. And he said, well, you're, you are welcome. This is the place for you. He said, but before I can open the gate, I need you to spell a word. And she said, uh, what? And he said, love. And she said, well, L-O-V-E. And he opened the gate and he said, you come right on in. And she went in and she was starting on into heaven. And, and Peter, uh, St. Peter grabbed her and he said, listen, I've got to leave my post for just a minute. Can you stay here while I, I make this, run this quick errand? I'll be right back. And she said, well, well okay. And she stepped behind uh, the desk where he was, and there she is at the pearly gate. And don't you know, up walks her scallywag of a, her cheating ex-husband <laughs> up, to the, up to the gate. <laughs> y'all don't even know where I'm going, and y'all think it's funny. I love y'all. It doesn't matter what I do, it's just fun. So up, up to the pearly gate walks this scallywag. And she looks at him and she said, well, you know, so you're here, I guess. And he said, well, yeah, and I'd like to come in. And she said, well, you got to spell a word. <laughs> and he said, well, what word? She said, Czechoslovakia. We're going to talk about the promise of heaven. I think we don't talk about it because there are misconceptions. I think sometimes we don't talk about it because we lack an assurance of heaven. Even as believers, we're a little uncomfortable with it because we're pretty sure we're going to go to heaven. Right? Almost, almost positive <laughs> that we're going to heaven. Right? We are... Right? We don't really want to talk about it because, you know, it gets a little uncomfortable. Uh, um, we've bought into a theology, um, a theology which is not the gospel. Then in order to get into heaven, we have to be good. Right? And there's a continuum. Right? And on that continuum, on one side is Mother Teresa. And on the other side of that continuum is Hitler. Right? And so we're somewhere in the middle. And as long as we are a step closer to Mother Teresa, right, then we're going to be okay. But what if it's a bad day? Right? So there's this, this, this question about how good is good enough? How good is good enough? And we're uncomfortable. If you don't get anything else this morning, let me announce over you, in Christ, 
you have an assurance of heaven. In Christ, you've been born again. The word says, the old has gone, the new has come. John 3.16 couldn't be more clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You are clothed in the righteousness of God. Because we're in Christ, we have an assurance of heaven. I'm going to entitle this talk, The Best is Yet to Come. Turn to your neighbor and say, The Best is Yet to Come. (laughs) I'm believing that by the time you leave here today, you'll say that, that with more gusto. I came across a quote when I was gathering and studying. There is no greater longing than the yearning to be assured of eternal life. I love that. There is no greater longing than the yearning to be assured of eternal life, which would make this also true. There's no greater fear than the fear of death. If you question the assurance of eternal life. And in the United States, we, we ought not have that problem because... Um, Studies show that over 75%, three-quarters of all Americans would identify themselves as Christians. 75% in the most recent, recent Gallup poll identify themselves as Christians. And yet, if you look, and I did, I went online just to look at lists of fears, It's amazing. The fear of death is right at the top. Although there are so many lists, everybody has a little bit of a bent towards their interest in their list. But I printed one out because I thought it was so fun. Um, This particular list, and, and the fear of death is number four on this list. But I thought it was interesting just to see what people are afraid of. In this one, uh, number one is a fear of spiders. Many of you are like, under, yeah, yeah, right? Two, uh, a rash, irrational fear of heights. Irrational fear of heights. Three is the fear of enclosed spaces. Claustrophobia. Four, and this list is fear of death. It's all, it doesn't matter what list you're in. The fear of death is there. We live in a Christian nation... would identify themselves as Christians, and yet at the top of every list of fears is the fear of death. So what's wrong with this picture, right? Believers, and yet a profound fear of death. We need to talk about heaven. We need some talk on heaven. I can tell you a reason I haven't focused on heaven more is is the concern that we'd buy into an escapist mentality. Um, It's a mentality where we would say, life is tough now, it's really hard now, I don't think I can make it through now, everything's falling apart, the world's going to hell in a handbasket now, Satan's running rampant now, but one day, right? But one day, I'm a fly away. Kind of an escapist mentality. It's essentially hiding from the world while we're awaiting the rapture. And if heaven's so wonderful, I thought, well, if we talk too much about heaven, women will just, we'll just want to escape. But that's not at all what the Bible teaches. The I'll fly away. Y'all know the song. Some glad morning when this life is o'er. I'll fly away. 
to a home on God's celestial shore. Right? The whole chorus. That's just all about that. The last verse. Just a few more weary days and then. Right. It's easy just to think, well, I'm just going to get out of here. That is not the gospel. God has things for us to do, ladies. He has a destiny for us to walk in. He has a mission. We aren't just waiting for the end. That's not what the gospel teaches. Let me tell you, the purpose of focusing... I feel like I'm, I'm clicking. That's because I am clicking. Is it, is it bad? <laughs> the purpose of fo- focusing on the promise of heaven is not for disengaging from the world. It's for gaining the courage to engage the world today. I'm telling you, if you grab hold of the truth about heaven, you get courage in you. You get boldness. Y'all, and I'm going to anchor what we're going to talk about this morning in Romans 8. And I laughed about that. We're going to be in Romans 8 again. We will, this is not, this study, it's called Great Expectations, Banking on the Promises of God. It is not a study of Romans 8. Right, But I feel like a number of times we talked about Romans 8, 28, and 29. Y'all remember what that was? God makes all things work together for our good. Right? It's a promise in Romans 8, 28. So we, we steeped in that. God makes all things work together for our good. Then Ashley taught... Um, a, uh, she shared, uh, she entitled it, We Never Pray Alone, out of Romans 8, 27, and 34, that talks about how the Spirit intercedes with us and for us. We never pray alone. So we're back in Romans 8 um, again today. And uh, I want to, your Bible ought to now fall open. If any of you want to get your Bible out, um, Romans 8 ought to just, your Bible should just open to, and I'm going to start at um, the 18th verse in, uh, in Romans 8. We've read just about everything else. I had to. Um, so Romans 8, 18 says this. I consider, Paul said, that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul is saying that the very worst suffering, the very greatest hardships, the greatest atrocities that you will ever experience or that you'll see or that you'll know about, the worst, they don't begin to compare with the glory of what's to come. You can't even put those things in the same category. You might think what you're walking through is unbelievably tragic and difficult. Paul says it doesn't begin to compare with the glory that's yet to come. It can't be measured against the glory of what is prepared for us in the plan of God for the redemption of all things. God's magnificent plan for those of us who are in Christ. Our here and now experiences, the challenge of that, can't begin to be compared with the glory that's coming. Paul says the future glory is beyond measure. We're going to go on in verse 19. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Now, now, what does Paul mean here for the sons of God, the sons and daughters of God, for the, to be revealed? What does Paul mean? We're not waiting for it to be revealed who we are in Christ. We know that we're daughters of the Most High God. Right? We know we're daughters of the King.
What's Paul mean then if he says we're waiting on this revelation? What Paul is saying is, yes, you know who you are in Christ. Yes, you're a daughter of the Most High God, but it hadn't been fully realized yet. I mean, you, you kind of know, but there's going to be a, a greater revelation that's yet to come. It's even going to be more amazing. Paul is speaking of a greater revelation which will come day when we, the children of God, actually reign with Christ. It's our inheritance. We know we are heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, but it's not been fully consummated, apprehended yet. I'm going to keep reading in Romans 8, starting at verse 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who, who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now you might be saying, what in the world is that talking about? What is Paul saying um, there? We know that the whole creation, Paul writes, has been groaning together as in the pains of childbirth. What he's saying is when sin came into the world, the curse of that sin touched the entire cosmos. If it had once been white, all of the cosmos became tainted. And everything entered into an inevitable state of decline and decay. In the garden, there was no decline. In the garden, there was no decay. There was no death. But when sin entered the world, so did decline and decay. And the whole earth, Paul says, along with us, is in a sense groaning. Paul also is saying that though the whole world groans, he says it groans in, in travail. Though the whole world groans into veil, it's not evidence of the end. It's not evidence of our demise. Your hardships don't define you as the end. We tend to think something's passing away. It's the end of something. But Paul is saying exactly the opposite. Paul is saying that the travail of this world, the, way, the best way he could describe it was to say the travail of this world is like childbirth. Now, women, those of you that have had children know that that kind of travail is a different kind of travail. Is it not? It's different. You know why? Because something good's coming, right? It's different than getting a finger, a splinter in your finger, right? You've got to dig it out. There's nothing good about that. You can't candy coat that. It's just bad. Most pain is, but God works all things together for good, Paul says. And this travail of the whole earth, of the whole cosmos, as if it's groaning, Paul said, is like a woman in childbirth. There's no denial that it's painful that it's travail. But it is, Paul said, the evidence. That travail, it's the proof that something new and better is coming. And it's ahead of us. This is good news, ladies. This is good news. And it comes in layers. It's so good, it's like an onion, and we can't even begin to unwrap all the layers. Those who die in Christ immediately depart to be in paradise with him. That's just the beginning. You remember the thief on the cross with Jesus? And he said to Jesus, he said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Today. 
today you will be with me in paradise. So those who die in Christ immediately depart to be in paradise with him. And it's good news, but that's, not the be- that's, that's just the beginning. That's not all the good news, that's just part of it. The word says the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised and those in Christ will be given glorified bodies, resurrected bodies. It's good news. Those bodies will be able to hold and emanate the full glory of God. Your body as it is can't begin to take in the glory of God. It it would explode. I I don't know what would happen. We can't even see God face to face. Moses, they had to put a veil So you're going to have a resurrected body that will be able to hold and emanate the full glory of God. And God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And those who are in Christ will reign forever on the earth with Him. It's good news. Why don't we talk about heaven more? The Bible's filled with images and information um, about heaven. Paul taught that once we accept Christ... We receive the Holy Spirit. So when you accepted Christ, when you became a Christian, you received the Holy Spirit. That's not something that's going to happen later. You got the Holy Spirit when you accepted Christ. And God has given us His Holy Spirit first to assure us of who we are, that we're children of God. So you have the Holy Spirit in you, and the Holy Spirit is constantly whispering, you're a daughter. You're a daughter of the Most High God. You're blessed with every spiritual blessing. You're the head, not the tail. You're more than a conqueror. You were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. The first thing the Holy Spirit does is come in and tell you who you are. We're daughters of God. So that's the first thing. But the Holy Spirit is also, Paul said, a deposit in us guaranteeing our inheritance to provide for us now what Paul calls in verse 23 of Romans 8, the first fruits. So you have the Holy Spirit in you that is is, um, providing for you the first fruits. That's the first of the blessings. That's what the first fruits are, the first of the blessings of resurrection power. His power in you, you're getting a glimpse, just little glimpses every day of the resurrection power that's in you. The Holy Spirit's doing that. It's just a a foretaste of what's to come. It's like, if I were to describe it just in, in earthly terms, I'd say it's like a sneak preview. Right? How many love to go to the movies? Right? Do you like a good movie? Do you go in time to see all the previews? The previews are now longer than the movie. Right? You can go to a movie 30 minutes late and still catch the opening scene. Right? I used to, I grew up calling them previews. Now they call them trailers. Right? I I don't have all the things. I'm going to call it preview because preview indicates it's to see before. So we watch previews when we go to the movies. A preview is just a very, very short version of the actual movie, right? They take this clip and that clip and this clip and that clip, and they they make it into a preview. It's just a really short version of the movie. It's not the movie itself. It's not the movie itself. It's only evidence that a movie exists, right? Right? But it's yet to come. If you like the preview, you're going to really like the movie. But you have to wait, right? Paul is saying the Holy Spirit is to us first fruits evidence, guaranteeing. We see these little snippets of the glory of God. That's his deposit. That's the first fruits. It's evidence of the amazing glory of what's to come.
It's a foretaste. The Holy Spirit gives us a glimpse of what is yet to come still in all its fullness. So we can see life as sneak, a sneak preview from the Holy Spirit for the coming attraction, which is heaven. And heaven is going to be above and beyond anything that we could ask or imagine. It's not an ethereal place or state of mind. You know, it's not, I mean, it's depicted, if you go online and look at cartoons, it's angels floating around, right, on a cloud, playing a harp, right? That's, that's what uh, the depiction, the earthly, often in our culture, uh, the depiction of heaven. Mark Twain's famous character, Huck Finn, in The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, wasn't at all excited about Miss Watson's instructions about heaven. It was this teacher, and she said um, that she was going to live. This is Huck talking, Huck Finn. She said she was going to live so as to go to the good place. That's the way she was going to live. Well, I couldn't see no advantage in going where she was going. So I made up my mind I wasn't even going to try for it. <laughs> now, she had a good start and went on and told me all about the good place. She said all a body would have to do there was to go around all day long with a harp and sing forever and ever. I, I didn't think much of it. <laughs> but I never said so. I asked her if she reckoned Tom Sawyer would go there to the good place. And she said, not by a considerable sight. <laughs> I was glad about that because I wanted him and me to be together. <laughs> no one would be excited about spending eternity floating around on a cloud and playing a harp, right? What if I told you that the scriptures about heaven show us that it's not an ethereal place or a state of a mind? Heaven's going to be filled with art, music, craftsmanship, never-ending discoveries and adventure, purposeful work and learning, feasting, dancing, grand parties, rejoining of old friends and family, development of exquisite intimate relationships, ruling and leading, resting, and discovering your ultimate destiny. Could you get excited about that? That's what the Bible teaches. What if I told you that the Bible doesn't really teach the immortality of the soul or some ethereal state of mind, but rather the Bible teaches the resurrection of the dead. That just as surely as God first scooped up some dust, you know, Genesis said he scooped up the dust, and he formed a man and he, whoo, he breathed life just as God did that for Adam in the book of Genesis. He breathed life to him and Adam became a living being. God's going to do that again. That one day in the mystery of God, he's going to come back in the person of Jesus and he's going to scoop up that same dust and he's going to blow, whoo, Life into us, a resurrected body. Could you get excited about the body you now have being resurrected and completely rebuilt into something that's like the body you have now? Only way better. Could you get excited about that? That's what a resurrected body is. It's your self-same body. It's just resurrected. What if I told you that it would be fully you in the same way that Jesus was fully Jesus in his resurrected body after the resurrection and that you would fully recognize those whom you now miss who died in Christ? Could you get excited about that? What if I told you that every part of this earth will be redeemed from death and decay? That there will be a new heaven and a new earth. They'll be united in a way that is currently beyond our understanding. All this and more 
is the picture of heaven in the Bible. But for now, Paul says, all creation is groaning and waiting eagerly. Like a cosmic homesickness. Have you ever been homesick? I've only been homesick once. It was terrible. Headache. I was a cap counselor for a summer. And I had, I had third grade girls. Man, and that first day or two of every week of camp, there was homesickness. There were headaches. There were tummy aches. Right? There were f- symptoms of flu. I, I had children throw up. Right? Just because of homesickness. Paul's painting a similar picture in Romans 8. It's like the travail is like homesickness. We are homesick now because this world is not our own. We were made for another home. C.S. Lewis, a brilliant literary scholar and author, said this, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If you have a hunger for food, it's most probable that food exists. If you know thirst in the desert, the first is probable evidence that there is something to satisfy it. If you are longing for something more, it is evidence that something more exists. If you long for something greater than even your best moments in life, It is evidence that you have tasted the first fruits. I mean, think of the best moment in your life. Just take a moment. Think of the best moment in your life. A a Christmas morning or an Easter day or the birth of a baby. What, a a wedding? Think of, of the best moment in your life. Maybe it's a time you realized a great dream. Or you experienced peace that surpasses all understanding. Go back and think of that moment. As you see yourself in that moment, isn't it true that you still yearn a little bit for something more? At the very least, in my greatest moments, I found myself a little sad that it was going to end. Right? If nothing else, when you're having a glorious moment, there's also a sadness because it's going to be over. It's going to end. So Paul says, if you feel that, if you feel a groan, even in your best moment, when you feel that and something in you groans, even just a little bit, remember what Paul said. That is the Holy Spirit in you reminding that you that you are travailing in childbirth until the perfection of heaven comes one day. And then the glory never ends. So when you're suffering, here's the invitation. Reinterpret your groan reinterpret your groan. When you feel rejected, the groan is telling you that one day there'll be a perfect acceptance. When you're aging and your body's not cooperating and tasks take longer to complete and you can't remember things as well as you used to, and we could talk about that for days, (laughs) right? You go upstairs and don't remember why you're there. The groan is telling you that you are going to be given a perfect body and a perfect mind. In a resurrected body. Because remember, only God can barah. When you are standing beside the grave of someone you love, That groan is the Holy Spirit in you, reminding you that you weren't made to live in a place where people die. You were made for a place where people live forever. Heaven will not only be the absence of pain and suffering, it will be the presence of everything you groan for now. 
we have a promise, a promise of heaven. Something exceedingly abundantly beyond anything we could ask or imagine. And it's special. It's a special promise because we have a deposit guaranteeing it. God didn't want us to miss it. So the Holy Spirit is in us, giving us tastes. Paul calls them the first fruits of what's to come. We can't begin to to take it in because it's way above and beyond anything that we would ask or imagine. I love what Paul says in Ephesians When you believe, this is Ephesians 1, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. That's what he calls it in Ephesians 1. You were marked in him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Isn't that great? God wants us to meditate, to apprehend his promise of heaven because our confidence in our inheritance will determine how we live now. We don't disengage from this world because we know one day we'll escape it. Instead, the promise, the guarantee of heaven, our inheritance in the saints, gives us courage for life today. I wanted to show, there's a picture, a slide I wanted to show before I end. My daughter's in college, and this slide uh, was put up recently by one of her professors as a, an activity, something to be thinking about, that they were going to talk about in class. And Abby took a picture of it and sent it to me and said, Mom, read the first question. So read the first question. And Abby texted me this. She said, literally, as I'm looking at this question, this is me right now, I'm going to live forever already. (laughs) And it changes everything. Amen?